using something that's that's from a farmer that I don't really want to manipulate too much. I, I'm just I'm a, I'm another hand in um, in, in a group of small group of people, and I, I just want to let that that expression of what's grown, what's seasonal. Um, be expressed on, on a plate, very, very simply. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The food media has glorified the status and importance of a chef in the public eye. The notion of celebrity chef isn't very palatable to many, but the advantages of getting a name for oneself can have a positive impact on business and your establishment. But not all chefs seek out the limelight but their influence should not be understated. Perry Hill is the executive chef of Bathers Bistro in Sydney. Perry, how are you? Really well, thanks. You've had a pretty stellar career in some incredible venues, but you've not really sought out the limelight. Um, Why why is that? Um, I suppose from early on, um, I saw, I suppose, firsthand... um, what were the pluses and also the minuses um, from taking on that sort of role of a celebrity chef or someone with a, a high media profile? And I sort of, I, I didn't consciously avoid it, but I definitely steered away from things. And there was opportunities that I still look back on and think, Oh, it could have gone this way, you know, those forks in the road of, of your career. And I, I actually think for me, I made the right choices for myself. But I, I can't say that, you know, for someone else that might have wanted that sort of experience out of their career. But I always saw myself, and I still do, as definitely in the trenches with the team still, you know, boning out the fish. And that's really where my passion lies. And I, I, I do see, you know, the, the, the side of the celebrity chef and think, wow, that would be nice to be wined and dined and, and that sort of thing. And I think there's, there's a part of everyone that has delusions of grandeur for that. But I, I actually, actually just you know, know what I know and know what I want. And I love what I do. And, you know, if people want to, uh, I suppose, celebrate, you know, what I do or talk about what I want to do or what I'm doing, well, that's fantastic. And I'd I'd love people to talk about it, but I definitely, I don't, uh, I'm not there emailing and sending out media releases or anything like that. And, and, you know, I put myself out there and, and, you know, do little, you know, things on Instagram and stuff like that because I, I use that as, I suppose, my um, my sort of creative expression. Um, but, yeah, definitely don't seek it out. Um, well, your influence has been incredible and we can get into your career shortly, but uh, take us back to when you were young. What, what was life like for you and what sort of role did food play? Oh, food was... Absolutely, and still is everything about almost every minute of my whole day, including sleep. Um, it, it might sound obsessive, or so, you know, I'm holding on too tight, or anything like that. And there's times where I'll just, you know, click out and take a break. Um, but definitely, you know, my parents were. We're, we're not chefs, but they were cooks, really good cooks. My mother um, was and still is an artist. Um, she trained with John Olson. My father worked with John Olson. Um, so that, that sort of artistic side came through. And then uh, artists and, and cooks or good cooks uh, sort of seem to go hand in hand, that creative experience of painting and and also cooking. There's a very much a, that European lifestyle of, of the arts and um, so my parents were artists, uh, still are, um, and more my mother. My, my father was a potter, but um, they certainly very, very uh, passionate about food. As a very young child, we moved up to the country. Um, 
we lived off the grid. It's what people call off the grid at the moment. Um, that was just our life. Uh, so there was no electricity, no running water. There was no phone for a long, long while. Um, and, you know, it, and, and honestly, you know, when I tell people this, they're like, oh, does that happen in Australia? Yeah, it does. Um, sure, it was the 70s. And there was, there was that, that whole movement of, uh, I suppose, people from Sydney up to the, the Byron sort of shire and stuff like that. And my parents were a part of that. They weren't hippies. I, I think, you know, I'd refer to them as true alternates. They sought out something completely different. And how it's affected my life is completely, utterly, you know, you know the whole thing. Like, it, it, I wouldn't be who I am without living in the bush off grid for the first, you know, like 11 years of my life. So that was really, really impactful. I mean, if we wanted water, we'd go down to the creek. Um, and, you know, that connection with just do it yourself and anything's possible um, is, is really, really important for me. And, and, you know, that property that we, that I grew up on is still a really important sounding board for me. So if I go on a holiday, I'll go there and I'll just sit out there or rediscover it. And when it was burnt by bushfire a couple of years ago during those terrible fires, it actually was one of the most devastating periods, I suppose, of my life at that point. I, I um, had sort of removed myself from, from I suppose, that area and, and I didn't sort of think about it. But when it happened, I was just like, oh, my God, that whole thing has, has been decimated and it was never going to be the same. Bush regenerates, but those really special spots around the creek and things like that were really important to us, um, is, have, have been devastated. But we grew our own produce, uh, not all of it. Um, we, we'd go on, on trips up to Lismore to buy dry goods and stuff like that. And most of my, a lot of my extended family are from that area. So, you know, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful area, but behind the scenes, it's, it, it's difficult and people struggle and they did certainly then. And my, my, it wasn't an easy life being completely isolated um, like that for my parents. And ultimately, you know, things had to change. Um, but certainly that experience was, you know, um, really grounding for me. Um, that connection with the bush with um, in a small way growing your own produce really, you know, it was, was the late 70s, early 80s. You know, no one was, you know, it, there, there wasn't restaurants doing that sort of thing. And my parents did have a food stall at the Channel Markets. So it gave me a first taste of hospitality. But yeah, I, certainly food is, you know, for me being, being a chef is just, just like a natural, just such a natural thing. I, I couldn't really do anything else other than maybe gardening or, or something like that. But yeah, it's, it's so natural. Well, it's tell me. us about when you sort of realized that perhaps chefing might be for you. Um, take us back to that time. Yeah. So I, I made the decision that let's, let's do this when um, I left home and I was, I was um, we'd moved several times and I became really, uh, passionate, obsessed about cycling. And I was a top amateur cyclist. And yeah, really, really, like I was, I was, had the whole mindset. I was going to go to Europe and go and do the Tour de France and Paris Roubaix and all that sort of stuff. And I'd train, you know, 800 kilometers a week as a, like a 17, 16 year old. And, um, you know, I, I sort of, I, I left home uh, with sort of like two hundred dollars and my bike, and joined uh, a local club down here in Sydney, and sort of reality dawned that you know everyone has delusions of grandeur, but I was like, how am I going to fund myself to do all of this? You know, um, behind all the glamour sports and that, the reality of being a sportsman is you're out there training all day and you can't have a job uh, most of the time because you're exhausted. So 
I, I reality bit and I thought, you know, am I going to be a fantastic cyclist for four or six years, um, especially with the drug culture and cycling at that time? And then what am I going to do after that? I'm, you know, all, all I want to do is either cook and, and eat food or grow food or be a cyclist. And I just, uh, I picked up the paper one day and there was a job out there and I went, I'm, I'm doing it, you know, and I said to my team, I'm doing this, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, I've got 20 bucks to my name, you know, I, I need, I need, you know, uh, financial support and, and a life, something sustainable. Um, so I did it, never looked back. Um, the adrenaline of the kitchen just drew me in the first day. Uh, it was, it was like, it was like being in a cycling race, but you're in a kitchen, you were working as a team, you had to interact with people, you know, when someone was slightly weaker or stronger and go in there and support them. And that's what cycling was for me. There was a, it was a team sport. And, and I just, I just went from one adrenaline activity to another and it was just fantastic. So I worked at this um, little brasserie called Menus Brasserie in Sylvania Heights. And, you know, I just threw my obsessiveness that I had with cycling straight into this and I worked epic, epic hours uh, and, and just loved it until I completely burnt myself out after two years and uh, ended up um, getting a job uh, for Luke Mangan at um, Bistro CBD. And I must have been 22 or something like that. And Luke was a pretty hard chef, known as a pretty hard chef. He was going places and... I wanted to, you know, experience everything. You know, I, I, I looked at cooking as, as just I needed to know everything, uh, like as a broad palette of all my skills. I needed to know how to make a consomme and, you know, all of that stuff, all the boning techniques, balancines, all, all that stuff. And, and so I was really attracted to that, that monastic type um, you know, heat and yeah, it was great. You know, re really enjoyed working with Luke and Bistro CBD was such a grounding experience for a whole lot of chefs. I mean, I look back on the team there um, and, you know, it was, it was, it was epic uh, in the kitchen there. And we, we really pushed, pushed really hard. And, um, you know, I learned a lot about myself. I, what a, what a lot of young people I think miss is is you've just got to you got to learn to fail, you know, repeatedly and come back every day. And I screwed up epically so many times. And Luke was just always supportive, hard man, hard man, and full respect to him. But you know, I I I screwed up mostly on myself. Um, but I'd, I'd go back, I'd go back. And the resilience that cycling and the physical, uh, I suppose, arduous of cycling uh, really helped me with, you know, just getting back, pushing on, just getting back. And, look, that's a good thing and a bad thing. These days it's so important, you know, f to instill in, in younger chefs and that, that balance. Of don't, don't do what I did and throw yourself completely into it because you can – just completely ruin yourself and you're no good to anyone and you end up, you know, pissing it up every second night. And, you know, it's, that's, that's, it's not all cool. Um, but uh, I look back and with, with really fond memories um, of that experience. You spent time with Yanni Christus at MG Garage as well. How different was he to oh, work with compared to the likes of Luke Mangan? Com completely different. Um, and, I, um, Luke had left CBD and I, le I, I'd been with Luke at that time for, for two and a half year or three years and I'd done my apprenticeship and it was just time to move on. So, um, my brother was working at MG Garage, my brother Theo, um, and, uh, he said, well, why don't you come and work at MG Garage? And I went and had a chat with Yanni and yeah, completely, completely different. And it was something I, I I, I honestly, probably looking back, I needed to 
change a little bit for myself. Um, I didn't think about it as a career course change. I didn't sort of plan it, but it happened. And um, it was amazing. And Yanni really immediately, we, we sort of clicked. Um, there was a lot of common ground, a full respect with Yanni. And I look back, you know, at, at when I started his career and I, I looked on with awe of what, um, he was doing. Uh, I started about three months after they opened and the place was really, really cranking um, and absolute wall to wall with, you know, food media and critics coming every second night. Um, and so the pressure was on. So it, I just went from one pressure situation to another and I ended up, um, Yanni promoted me to the, the kitchen layout and his hierarchy is slightly different to other other businesses, but he, he promoted me to head chef of main course section. Um, and I stayed there for a couple of years, really enjoyed it, worked with some amazing, amazing people. His recipes are so detailed, Yanni's, and he's got this amazing collection of different recipes that go through the decades, like there'll be a bouillabaisse recipe from the 70s and then another one from the 80s where he's changed it a little and, you know, in relation to, because food flavours and fads and fashion and people's palates do change. So uh, he, he always had those little adjustments through the decades and you know, it was fascinating going through his recipe cards and and, and being a part of that whole thing and, and learning uh, being able to throw myself into what what Luke had started with with using offal, and Yanni had that all completely, you know, the the lamb's heads, you know, the the veal liver as an entree, and these little very very modern at the time, but harked back to very traditional um, French foods. That that technique was there, and. At the time, I really thought my career direction was going and working at three star Michelin restaurants and three three hatted restaurants. That was going to be my career projection, and I'd go and work in France and all that sort of stuff. That's what I was thinking. But uh, I um, met my now wife, and we travelled overseas, and things changed a little. Um, yeah, it was exciting. You ended up working at the River Cafe in London. You already had a strong connection with produce, with the way that you grew up. What, what, what sort of impact did working at that establishment have on your connection with produce? Well, I, I think for, for me, the most impactful period of time um, was, was actually the break between working at MG Garage and River Cafe because I went on this tour, four-month tour of Europe, starting in Greece, went to Turkey, Italy, uh, and I had this amazing experience in the Amalfi Coast in Italy that pretty much, I suppose, sent signals to myself of where my career was going to go. And one morning, uh, we hired a unit in, in Amalfi, uh, and I, would, I made sure I had a kitchen because I wanted to cook from the markets. Didn't want to do it every day. We, we ate out, but I wanted to cook from the market. So we went... Um, down to the markets every couple of days and, and I'd cook there. And one morning I decided, okay, I'm just going to go for a walk. I woke up early, went up to the stairs behind Amalfi and I found a place that just reminded me so much of my childhood. I stood there and I had a bit of a, a moment and it was so um, impactful in the future that I still look back on I think if I didn't have that moment, I would be a different chef or a different person and what happened was I was walking through the gardens of the Amalfi coast and there was a house there was a mother and her children and her mother was calling them to pick something in the garden just like my mother did when I was a child and I just thought okay if this is what food is like this powerful memory of food why can't I relate it why can't I cook something more simple? Why am I so attracted to, you know, the, the high stakes of a Michelin-starred restaurant, three Michelin-starred restaurant? I had that all in my mind. And I thought, wait a second, there could be a different path. And it wasn't until I sort of, I didn't fall into the River Cafe, but 
something didn't work out when I went into London. I, I tried that and I went to speak to Tom Atkins at Pierre de Terre and stuff like that. And something just didn't gel. I went and spoke to someone else and it just didn't work out. And then someone said, why don't you try the River Cafe? You know, it's, it's, and I went there and it just immediately, it just completely gelled. The smell of wood fire reminded me of my childhood because we lived off the grill, off the grid. So that, 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 that immediate, you know, connection with the little garden out the front um, of the River Cafe, the food that was so pared back that it had three ingredients. So if you, you screwed it up, you just really screwed it up. You know, there was, no, there was no hiding behind it. There was no hiding behind a little sauce and a puree and a dust of this and something dried. It was spaghetti and clams and chilli and parsley and lemon juice and fantastic olive oil. And that's what it's all about. And it spoke to me more about life than being a chef per se. And that was really powerful. And the, the ability every couple of weekends or every, once a month to fly to Europe and experience food cooked by people, you know, in small, small restaurants that are not tourist restaurants really, really impacted my career in a, in a massive way. The connections with, yeah, sure, there was people like Jamie Oliver and April Bloomfield there and, you know, you know I had such a good time working next to Ben O'Donoghue as well. So there, there was always fantastic people to work with. But certainly I, I probably at the time didn't know it was going to impact that year and a half I was there so much on my career, the River Cafe. And for years, years after, I'd wake up, during the night and I would dream about being doing prep in the kitchen and looking out through the windows at, 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 at the river and the garden. And I just wake up and I go, Oh my God, I'm back here in Australia. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was fantastic. What was it like when you came back to Australia and translating this sort of connection that you've, you had and this ethos that you had fell, fell in love with? massive culture shock. I'd been gone two years and things had changed um, so much. It was the Olympics um, and I'd, just, I'd gone from cooking this really pad back food um, that I just, I don't think, I don't think Australians at the time maybe fully understood that sort of thing. I think when, when customers see chefs, they want, they want, the chef to put on a show of technical prowess. And I, I don't think at the time that sort of, I, I, I wasn't confident that that translated. So I had a real period of a couple of years of real sort of insecurity. And I went back and worked with Luke and I worked at Salt. I worked at Bistro Lulu, which was fantastic. And Salt was, you know, was great as well. Luke had plans for a, a restaurant on Bondi Beach um, and we were throwing around ideas and I sort of I wanted that connection uh, with simplistic food. So we ended up, we ended up sort of settling on a, a sort of um, a light version of uh, Middle Eastern, North African food. And, yeah, it was called Moorish and on North Bondi and the – the opening was the pre-opening was played with building problems, um, and we really just hung on for for life to to get it open, and it worked really really well. Uh, and I was super super happy with the food, and I started it was my first head chef gig, and I was also the licensee, so that gave me a taste of managing not only the kitchen but also being in charge of, I suppose, uh, being responsible for an operation. And it wasn't just about that. So really fun times. I look back on that with uh, really fond memories. And that that didn't last. That that lasted a couple of years. Um, but the cooking on Bondi Beach was fantastic. It's super, super seasonal. And, you know, anyone will tell you it's a complete nightmare transitioning from summer to winter uh, in, in Bondi. It's, it's, uh, it's a constant game of, losing staff, gaining staff, trying to retrain people. Um, so that was stressful in itself. But um, uh, Luke ended up 
um, not being involved with the project. And I, I, um, I'd done the same thing I'd done previously and just, I suppose, you know, really, really exhausted myself and needed a break. Uh, so, um, I went over to, uh, something completely different, Mexico for a holiday and I came back and, um, I'd always been absolutely in awe of the boathouse on Blackwater Bay. I mean, I, I can clearly remember my first Claire de Lune oyster, um, and I, I'd eat there regularly before I, I, I got the, the the head chef job there, and it was just I, I pretty much, I mean, Martin Ben had left, and I pretty much badgered Tony Pappas. Until he, he he basically gave me the gig, and I, I in the meantime I he he I, I did a gig for uh, with Luke in Morocco for a couple of weeks, and that was amazing. But I came back and went straight into to the boathouse on Blackwater Bay, and I just I just relished it. I, I threw myself in again, and seafood has always been so special to me. It it's it's such a precise um uh cooking uh technique to cook seafood really really well it it's it's a matter of seconds the skill level the dedication to dry filleting and managing all the seafood is 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 requires so much patience and technique um and communication with suppliers and i just loved every minute of it and one one thing i just really loved which reminded me so much of the River Cafe was daily changing menu. You know, it's just, it's such, you know, such a, a powerful tool to, to show off what's actually happening. Um, and, you know, I, I, I still obsess over daily changing menus, but they're so hard on staff um, trying to get consistency for staff and staff training, it, 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 it's a bit nightmarish. But if you're obsessive about it, it is, there's, only, there's only a daily changing menu. Um, and it, it just able to showcase the, the produce at its best. Something just changes. You get small runs of things. It's, it's yeah, it's what I, what I loved. And I just, I loved it to bits. And I probably burnt myself out after five and a half years um and you know i i i needed i'd had kids at that time and we just needed my wife and i needed to jump out of sydney and i sort of thought i had this idealistic notion that a change uh to the country would would be some sort of home returning to the northern rivers and you know it's it's Life is always full of challenges, and and the change was as great for me leaving the boathouse, which I honestly and and I look back and I I sat down with Tony Pappas and I said, oh, you know, you know, I think I I need to you know move on. But I I I thought to myself, even as I was saying it, am I right here? I'm leaving the most beloved. <laughs> restaurant I have ever worked in my career and it suits me so much but I just I need I needed to do that for my young kids and I felt I felt that if I continued I might really really burn out and and not be able to um deliver uh properly um and I think that mentality goes back to being sort of maybe a team, that team sport thing in cycling, sort of a bit of a, you know, yeah, bit bit sort of, you know, tap out, you know, when when you know you know when you need to tap out. I suppose is what I'm saying. But yeah, was was a big change. You returned to the Northern Rivers and opened your own uh, restaurant there. Yeah. What, what were the positives of that? I know you had challenges with, yep. with that, but were there some positives to come from that experience for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I, I left there and I got a job in uh, sort of a hotel in Ballina and that, that, that just, that was sort of like a, a stopgap. I, I think at, at the time I was, I was really committed to it, but, 
a lot of part of me it just just didn't it just didn't work and i needed to do something myself in in the heart of myself i i i wanted to i suppose show something that that i could do but you know i didn't want to do something that was sort of like my you know philosophy about life and ego and food you know in a on a, on a plate i wanted to cook something that was approachable that was healthy that 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 by that time i understood that i as a chef i needed to have creative expression that's really really important but i was starting to and i certainly i i learned very very quickly that you needed to be a business person you needed to appeal to a market you needed you needed to fight for, I mean, just to get the place opened, I had to fight tooth and nail just to get the lease. Um, and a lot of people probably don't understand that, that you know, they're outside the industry or just on the fringe, that, that just getting the doors open of a business is just, it's so, so difficult sometimes. Um, and, you know, we were certainly lucky. We had so many people that helped us, so much support. And, you know, Lismore might sound like the most bizarre choices, but it all made sense to me at the time. And it still makes, it still, when I look back on it, it makes sense to me, you know, that a lease or, or buying a business in Byron is just, it's, it's not for a chef. It's for a group of chefs with a whole lot of backers. And I didn't have that and I didn't want to do that. Um, I wanted to go on my own. And so, you know, my parents supported me and we just did, I threw everything I could at it. Uh, and, and it took, took ages to get off the ground. But I think I learned so much about myself through that process. Uh, and during it, I probably didn't learn as much as I could because I was so exhausted and just trying to keep it up, trying to keep things going trying to look at all the different angles. And I, I tell people now, if you're running a business, try and have some fun. You know, try and look at it as this is what you've always wanted to do in your whole life. So don't, don't make it all about, don't be so stressed about it like I was. You know, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be stressed, you know, because I knew behind the scenes that I was – taking home a third of the pay of what I'd, I'd previously done. You know, things were tight. You know, we, you know it's, it's when people walk down the street as customers and look at a small business, they're not, they're not making money. They're doing it for passion 90% of the time, you know, 90% of the time. And they're doing it for the satisfaction of employing people. Uh, I had some fantastic people that I employed there that that was so so skilled um and you know people look at country towns or small little country towns and go oh this might be you know you know i'll drive through it and they might dismiss the talent that's behind the scenes of country towns uh it's there and you know behind the scenes of every small little cafe and pub and stuff like that there's people super, super passionate about using local produce. They're going to the organic markets and they're not filmed by television cameras or they're not in some magazine, but they're doing it really on the ground and they will never see recognition. You'll never hear their names. And these are the people that uh, honestly deserve to see the spotlight on them occasionally. Um, you know, they're the growers that are out the back just trying to make it right um, and, and using heirloom produce and not spraying. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a battle, you know, it's, it's for a lot of these people, it, it's living on razor's edge, you know, that Goanna song. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, they're living on razor's edge, you know, and they're living the dream up at Byron, but, you know, they're working three jobs and, you know, it's, but I, I loved every minute of it. Things had to change as well. And I had to move on uh, as well. 
when you came back to Sydney, you were um, part of uh, a really colourful, vibrant uh, restaurant, Botanica Vaucluse. Um, t- tell us a bit about what it was like um, working there. Yeah, look, I, I, I suppose a lot of people um, might not know it and it, it, it's, it was something I, um, when I met the owners, I, I became very passionate about their view on things and understood their direction and that, I suppose, I wanted to see uh, their through. So they, they wanted us to cook with local produce, organic produce, they, they, in the process at the time I started, were going to buy a farm. Uh, they ended up buying a farm. So it was just amazing working straight with the farmers, you know, growing. I, I'd tell them what seeds to grow and I'd go down there and they'd grow that and I'd see how it goes. And just the, that, that connection of, of having a farm, it was about 70-acre farm, so there was cattle on there and stuff like that, but... It, it was it was really really amazing, and that's that was one of the really driving things for me. That connection with, I suppose, that childhood thing of being able to walk out into a garden, pick something, get inspiration. The connection with the growers was super super important. Um, it was a super super challenging site. Um, it, it's you know it's there's no there's no point in in hiding it. It's 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 a restaurant on. A, uh, a site where there's an aged care facility. It's not immediately glamorous, you know. If 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 um, you know, people don't associate the two together. But the owners, Mark and Yvette, they really, really were passionate about changing the complete dynamics and conversation about why does aged care need to be treated like this gated community? Why do, why does it why does that need to happen? And it was the first place in Australia um, that that had a business, an outlet that was completely forward focusing for external clients and guests and re- people that wanted to come in the restaurant, but was also accessible to the residents. And you know, to me, that was a really honourable and still is an honourable and fantastic. Uh, idea and concept that really, really needed validation, and I wanted to be a part of that. And the enormous challenge—I mean, so many people said to me, "Perry, what are you doing? You're a chef. You're a rest chef in a restaurant. Why are you? Why are you doing this?" And I said, "What? Why? Why can't people like like guys like Bob Dylan? They're they're 75. They're almost in aged care facilities." And I thought to myself, "Well, wh- why can't I?" Why can't why can't why can't they have access? Why can't we showcase a facility or a restaurant that's not just for that? And um, so, super super challenging. I learnt so much about um, marketing and being able to um, get your voice out through the challenges of that site. I I learnt so much about again getting your message out to the right people, being able to people understand what you're doing uh, and and working every single customer, convincing every single customer that of, of, of your journey, uh, really, really important. And, and the food was designed to be super healthy as well. So there's lots of challenges in the, in the site. Uh, so I really enjoyed that, but Along came this thing called COVID, which doesn't really mesh well with, you know, the vulnerability of that age group. So um, that that was that came to an end through the challenges of lockdowns, and also trying to maintain everyone's, I suppose, health. You know, so um, yeah, that that came to a came to an end and. The opportunity to work at, at Bathers Pavilion came up and it's just such a fantastic, iconic venue. I had to be part of it um, and such a spectacular site. The ability to cook food that's almost like um, people's neighbourhood bistro. They drop down, 
friends, families, that that place where people just drop in. I, I really love that that sort of attitude. Um, so it's really rewarding, um, and it's really seafood driven, which which again just I love. You've had an incredible ability to take learnings from all sorts of experiences through your career. Well, has the last two years changed you and the way you approach what you do? Yeah, I think I think what what I've learned through these lockdowns is number one, you've got to be resilient. You, you've you've got to know that you're going to make mistakes, and it's been actually the first opportunity where I've really, apart from having sort of a holiday or something like that, where I've really, lockdowns have treated me to an aspect of, okay, I have got this time off and I don't need to do anything. And I was in, I put myself in really, really poor health over years of really, I suppose, just pushing the boundaries probably too much and being obsessive and, Look, I, I won't say I'm a workaholic, but, you know, hospitality and the hours sort of help a workaholic really achieve their workaholic goals. Um, so I'm sort of there, but I'm, I'm trying my best. But lockdowns really helped me. I, I, I reached a point where um, my cholesterol was about 13 and um, the doctor sort of looked at me with, a glazed look and went, you need to do something about this. And it, it all sort of meshed in. So I, I've, I started to get fit through the lockdown. So that's been really, really important uh, health-wise, having that sort of time and recognising you need balance. I mean, Bathers is such an iconic venue and so, so busy. I mean, I think probably half of Sydney's rest, uh, chefs have worked there at some time. Um, and they'll all attest that it's just a super, super busy place and you've, you've got to have that ability to switch off. So I'm really trying to develop that switch. Um, and, yeah, so, so that break with COVID really sort of helped. And there's been numbers of breaks. There was a Northern Beaches outbreak which sort of affected us. But, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I've learned so much about, just take every day as it comes because you just don't know. There's no point in worrying about it. You don't know what to expect. There's going to be something crazy happen and you've just got to go with it. There's no point in, in sort of, I suppose, fantasizing about what the future will be and trying to, you've got to predict some elements, but you've just got to roll with things sometimes. And, you know, the dirty word that everyone talks about pivoting your business. Yeah. You've just got to accept that things are going to change and you've got to accept that you've got to remove your ego from the equation completely because, you know, what I learned about running my business was that people ultimately want to go to a restaurant for fantastic foods a great environment, a rewarding experience, they're not necessarily there for an expression of your ego on a plate. Um, you need to be able to uh, be confident with what you're, you're selling, but don't let that be distracted and don't try and sell something that um, the people don't want. You force things. In my first year at, at my business, I refused to have a ham and cheese sandwich on my breakfast menu because I was just obsessive about everyone else is doing ham and cheese sandwiches and I'm not going to. And I eventually gave in and did a ham and cheese sandwich. And, oh, my God, the turnover that I had from it allowed me to get some help in. And I just stopped fighting it. I stopped fighting that stupid ego thing. Um, it comes around every now and then. You know, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> what do you love about what you do? Um, I, I do love that no two days are the same. Um, I do love the connection with um, using something that's, that's from a farmer that I don't 
really want to manipulate too much. I, I'm just, I'm, a, I'm another hand in, um, in, in a group of, small group of people. And I, I just want to let that, that expression of what's grown, what's seasonal, um, be expressed on, on a plate very, very simply. Um, and I, I don't, I don't want to fuss over it. What I do find really, really rewarding at the moment is um, working with a whole lot of very young, passionate chefs on their career journey and setting them out of guiding them, mentoring them. It's, it's something that, that, that I find incredibly rewarding, but I'm building and building, I suppose, a lot more confidence in myself with it. And I, I say this after 30 years of cooking, that, that you, you constantly do challenge yourself. Um, and for me, this is a really, this period is, is, I love doing that. I love handing my knowledge on, uh, training, just showing them simple things. And some things just won't click to me, you know, I, I, I'm, because I'm so used to, to doing it. I, I take it for granted that I know what to do, but seeing someone take something and then using that knowledge um, and being able to pass it on is, is powerful. So I'm, I'm really, really um, focused on that and enjoying that as a part of my, um, I suppose, daily routine. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, really rewarding. Well, Perry, it's been an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear just a bit of your story, and I know there's so much more to it, so um, please keep in touch and um, perhaps we can catch up again soon. Cheers, really appreciate it. Thank you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.